This is what happened in the world since we last uploaded. In a week where we saw the Prime Minister flailing... Let's not all of us who sit in glass houses here start getting into that. The Labor Party had its first major policy launch. All the beers now no, it's are not fruity. fruity. The fruit, fruit at, if I am Prime Minister, I right. will ban fruit being put in a beer. Wow. <laughs> Finally, a PM with a plan to tackle corona. But we begin on Thursday with the world's unsexiest tech launch. Now, the New South Wales Police Commissioner has proposed using an app to record consent in a bid to reduce sexual assault. Mick Fuller says consent can no longer be implied and technology could be used to formalise the habit. The proposed app could require users to register their name, their age and tick a box stating they understand sexual consent. A foolproof idea, since I know I always read the full terms and conditions before I just click accept. And it wasn't long before the app united everyone. Now this surely, no disrespect to Mick Fuller, is beyond ridiculous. Anybody who's ever been assaulted or has even been sort of edged and pushed into something knows this is a bad idea. But how does it actually protect? women. I'm sure that Mick Fuller's heart was in the right place today, but I think he's learnt a salient lesson. Please just stop doing the talking and start doing some of the listening. Wow, if Alan Jones can agree with the project, then maybe anything is possible. Commissioner Fuller's idea was even slammed by Commissioner Fuller, who said this app might be the worst idea he's had all year. But it's only March. Plenty of time for a worse idea. Uh, what about preventing zoo crime by giving every chimp a gun or uh, continuing to allow officers to strip search children? I mean, so many possibilities. Maybe the worst part of Mick's worst idea was that in an article where he wrote that of 15,000 reported sexual assaults, less than 2% of cases end in guilty verdicts, his solution was an app that would actually help perpetrators and not, say, redrafting New South Wales consent laws, which still allow for an acquittal if the accused simply believes the complainant was consenting. What we need is consistent national consent laws. It's the exact kind of essential, urgent project that would be perfect for the Attorney-General. Uh, but unfortunately, he's on leave at this time. Friday was Spy Day, and I caught up with this alarming announcement by ASIO. At least a dozen spies have been removed from Australia accused of trying to infiltrate our government. Our top spy in a rare public appearance revealing a nest of spies had been evicted from Australia. Australia won't publicly name the country, but security sources are privately pointing at Russia. That's right, Russian nesting spies. Particularly dangerous because you think you've caught one but there are always smaller spies hiding inside. So just who were these spies targeting? Current and former politicians, a foreign embassy, a state police service and successfully recruited an Australian government worker with a security clearance. They also picked a versatile forward in the AFL draft and voiced two characters on Bluey. And Australia's not the only country with a Russia problem. US President Joe Biden has claimed Russia's leader Vladimir Putin is a killer. So you know Vladimir Putin, you think he's a killer? Mm-hmm, I do. So what price must he pay? The price he's gonna pay, well, you'll see shortly. Vladimir wasn't gonna take the killer accusation lying down. I remember when we were young and would bicker out in the yard. We would say, I'm rubber and you're glue. Bad names bounce off me and stick to you. Classic playground banter. Takes one to no one. Whoever smelt the corpse dealt the corpse. I am rubber, you are glue. I was in KGB, can kill man with pencil. And like all true killers, he challenged Biden to a no-holds-barred, one-on-one debate. I want to invite Biden to continue this discussion, but on the condition we do it live, online, without any delay, in an open, direct discussion. Yes, this is just like Rocky IV, East versus West, which explains why, after hearing that taunt, Joe Biden immediately went into training, got back up and went... OK, look, maybe training will have to be delayed. To the weekend, and with floods extending from Queensland to Gippsland, covering an area the size of Alaska, more than 10 million Australians were facing an extreme weather warning. There is a flood emergency gripping New South Wales. Relentless rain and overflow from Warragamba Dam, releasing enough water to fill one Sydney harbour per day. Unfortunately, some uh, breaking news that we have received about a fatality in the northwest of uh, Sydney. The scale of the flooding emergency is 
simply staggering. An insurance catastrophe was declared as the news was filled with confronting images of devastation that was almost impossible to plan for. You can see the partially submerged Windsor Bridge. Ironically, it's been built to be floodproof. Well, I hope we kept the receipt. While we struggled to come to terms with the devastation of this once-in-a-century flood, locals grabbed the essentials and evacuated, and the media ripped into action with wall-to-wall -wall coverage of a storm so powerful even the Channel 7 studio appeared to be flooding. And the award for most tasteful flood coverage went to the Sydney Morning Herald's front page, which had flood news accompanied by a half-page domain ad asking the question, time to move? Well, it is a great time to sell, I now have a three-bedroom pool. Next, Monday. Peter Van Onselen, or PVO, whose POV on issues dealing with the PMO have lately been a POS. At the macro level, uh, I couldn't be happier uh, that there is this shift that has occurred so that women are coming forward. At the micro level, though, uh, if it's someone you know uh, and if they claim that they are innocent, boy, it's a difficult issue. Right. Annabelle. I don't know what to make of that. Well, PVO dropped a bombshell as another whistleblower spoke out about Canberra's toxic culture. He's a Canberra insider. He's been at the very heart of it. And he's agreed to blow the whistle to 10 News First on men behaving badly and the denigration of women in Parliament House, if we protect his identity. So we'll call him Tom. Tom appeared on, oh, I'm not sure which network, sorry, and revealed evidence of incredibly disturbing acts committed by some of the most pixelated people in Parliament. We've taken great care to blur or distort the images, but what's happening is unmistakable. This man is sitting at a desk, exposing himself. You can't see it, but he's staring straight at the camera. That's a copy of the Parliament House rule book beside him. Which, if he had a spare hand, he could open, read and know not to do exactly what he's doing. And the revelations only became more disturbing and more pixelated. Here a man arrogantly points to the desk of a female Liberal MP, then performs a solo sex act on it. It's far too explicit to show or even describe. This group of coalition staffers also routinely swap explicit photos of themselves. I've received so many that I've just become immune to it. It's a disgusting culture and also a shitty WhatsApp group. I mean, share a recipe, you blurry freaks. But it wasn't just what was happening, which I couldn't really make out, it was where it was happening. According to Tom, government staffers and even MPs often have sex in this small room on the upper level of the building. It's known as the prayer room or the meditation room. You've been told by people who say they've had sex with MPs? Yes. In the meditation room? Yes. I could probably say there's very little meditation or prayer going on in that room. Eminent journalist PVO then got to the bottom of exactly what was going on in the prayer room. A lot of sex. A lot. Heaps. On Tuesday, the reaction to the pixelated Van Onselen bombshell continued and pixelated heads started to roll. Nationals MP Michelle Landry offered this opinion on the parliamentary desk wanker. You know, he was a really good worker and he loved the place. Some would say he loved it a little too much. The Prime Minister has had a lot of experience giving defensive press conferences lately and as he once again stepped up to the Prime Ministerial Apology podium, he was keen to show he'd done a lot of what you ladies call listening and had learned some new empathies. So as much as it has been a topic of discussion here and around the country, specifically in relation to these disgraceful acts, it is something that has been the lived experience of Australian women for a very long time. But much like a band, when the challenging new material didn't get a big response, he went back to playing his greatest hits, starting with the Morrison classic, The Women In My Life. Criticise me, if you like, for speaking about my daughters, but they are the centre of my life. My wife is the centre of my life. My mother, my widowed mother, is the centre of my life. To them, I say to you girls, I will not let you down. I believe in my girls. I believe in all the women of Australia. Yeah, I believe in women too. They definitely exist. Next on the set list was the perennial favourite, Baby, We Can Fix This. We must get this house in order. We must put the politics aside on these things 
and we must recognise this problem, acknowledge it, and we must fix it. He then brought it all home with an encore performance of my office. What about your office? Doesn't it look like you've lost control of your ministerial staff here? Well, I'll let you editorialise as you like, Andrew. Um, but if anyone in this room wants to offer up the standards in their own workplaces by comparison, I'd invite you to do so. Well, they're better than these, I would suggest. Problems. Well, let, well let, 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 let me take you up on that. Let me take you up on that. Right now, you'd be aware in your own organisation that there is a person who has had a complaint made against them for harassment of a woman in a women's toilet. And that matter is being pursued by your own HR department. The unavoidable question being, why does the PM know more about what's happening in other offices than he does in his own? Although it turns out his knowledge of other workplaces was a little sketchy as well. News Corp hit back, saying that's simply untrue. The PM issuing an apology overnight, conceding he accepts the media giant's account and he was wrong to raise it, adding the emotion of the moment is no excuse. XOXO, Gossip Girl. Already having a blinder, Scott Morrison decided to let the good times roll and stopped in at old mate 7.30. 7.30's invited the Prime Minister for an interview more than 13 times. And put in what was by far his best media performance of the week. In fact, it was the second best interview of the week after... A lot of sex. A lot. Which brings us back to the latest scandal and the one question that remains. Who is Tom and how did pixelated Van Onselen get this interview? Well, The Weekly has obtained this previously unaired footage. All right, great. Got what you need? <sighs> That'll teach them to text me that sh so that's where he's been. Hmm.